Hi, welcome to Emerald Hill Skies. My name's Doug, and tonight we're doing a Skylet. It's a, a review of some kind of an application or a tool that we're using in trying to learn to observe well with Electronically Assisted Astronomy, EAA. And tonight's review is on the new 1.0 release of Stellarium. Stellarium is an open source planetarium software. If you've come across planetarium software before, you know that it's basically an application on your, <clears throat> on your notebook computer, on your desktop computer, or on a, a smart device, smartphone or tablet, that enables you to simulate the way the night sky looks. All the stars, planets, nebulae, deep space objects you can imagine. And not only can you do that for the sake of just enjoying the view when it's a rainy night, uh, perhaps uh, cloudy, but also so that you can uh, plan your observations and then during the observation or uh, whatever, you're, you're just night out under the stars, you can use the tool to help you uh, deepen your understanding of the night sky. Uh, so we typically call this genre of application, uh, we call this kind of software uh, planetarium software because when you're in planetarium you lean back and you look up at the dome and you see all the stars and the guide takes you through a kind of a story of the night sky, it shows you different stars or uh, history or constellations or something. Well, in a way, that's what these applications are doing. And Stellarium is an open source uh, application, meaning that it's really not uh, sold by a company that wants to make money off of you. Instead, it's some guys that got together and just loved what they were doing. They loved the night sky and they endured or loved programming so that they could bring people like you and I these kinds of programs. They do it for essentially nothing, although they accept donations in many cases. Open source means they put all the code out in the open, and that way you can see what's inside of it and you can make sure it's not going to harvest data on you. Uh, what's more, it means that it's going to be free for you. So Stellarium is a free program, and that means you get to enjoy it no matter where you live on Earth, no matter what your financial situation, and really no matter what language you speak. There's going to be a language in Stellarium that you can probably utilize. So it's a, it's a great piece of software and one that I kind of put off going to. I first tried softwares like, uh, you know, Starry Night Pro, maybe uh, several years back. I came back into astronomy just a year and a half ago and I wanted to use uh, Sky Safari. It wasn't available for Windows, so I actually operated it inside of a, of a kind of a, an operating environment that's called BlueStacks. And then I translated to another environment, uh, Alpaca. And, you know, they were always kind of, to me, uh, kind of like uh, kludgy and, and, and kind of wrapped together with binder twine and barbed wire. It really wasn't a very fun solution because there were so many loose ends I had to worry about. And uh, what's more, it really didn't talk very well sometimes to the rest of my equipment. I know there are a lot of you out there that might be using Sky Safari via BlueStacks. And, I used it for a long time, so believe me, I, I know that it's it's a beautiful program. I eventually got tired of all that kludgy mess of connections that I had to try to worry about, and I went back to Starry Night Pro, bought the Plus version. It was a beautiful uh, landscape of the night sky, but over time there were several rough edges that sort of drove me away, not the least of which was the fact that the company wasn't cooperating much with me and trying to fix some of the glitches I was finding that really annoyed me. So then I went back out on the web and looked again. I tried different things, Redshift and a bunch of other software. I finally came back to Stellarium. Now for a long time, Stellarium was operating with what you might call a zero point X additions. And what that means in, in uh, application parlance is that the developers didn't really think they had a 1.0 version very much yet. All that changed a couple of weeks ago. Here in October of 2022, I don't know when you're watching this video, but as I uh, produce this video tonight, as we make this video, Stellarium has just become a 1.0 software. That means quite a lot. It means that this team of developers and all the volunteers helping them uh, really 
two key guys and maybe four or five others that are really pitching in hard, and then a whole community of people that have, that have contributed to it in one way or the other, they finally all felt like they were ready for a 1.0 release. And there were a lot of nuts and bolts that went into this, and really that's beyond the scope of this review tonight. I guess the summary only which to say would be that uh, they, they felt good enough about the program. And this was after like a, I don't know, a 20 year track record of assembling this program one piece of software at a time. They went through several versions of, of the, the kind of the framework that drives Stellarium. And to be honest, I tried it a while back and it really didn't uh, work very well with my laptop. And I had a fairly recent laptop, but this version, the 1.0 version is beautiful and so far it's working completely glitch free. Now, uh, caveat is I didn't, I wasn't able to operate it in full screen mode when I was doing uh, live streams like this. Uh, that just didn't work for me. Uh, maybe it works for somebody not doing live streams, but for me I had to operate in a window mode. And if you're familiar with what that means, it means that, uh, you know, the, the software isn't taking up the whole screen like a TV like a TV screen would. Instead, it's operating, at least in the Windows environment, inside a window. And the key to that is the F11 key. If you go into Stellarium and you notice it's full screen and you're having trouble, it's kind of hesitating sometimes. And when you try to alt tab back and forth between different Windows programs, it doesn't seem to behave quite right. And maybe it blips some, you know, it kind of drops out. Just hit the F11 key and that'll drop it to Windows mode. And I think that'll take care of all your problems. It did with me. So this review is kind of an objective review that I'd like to do. Uh, as you can tell, I'm going a little bit of a deep dive into Solarium. In a way, it's a summary of what many others do in their reviews, like one nug at a time. I'm kind of summing up the big picture. And if, if God wills and things work out, maybe I'll do deep dives into different components and get deeper in each of them. But right now, I just kind of like to do a, a big picture review of what I'm learning. Because honestly, I've just been back into this software for about a month, but so far it's really clear sailing. Um, I'm going to do this at the telescope. I do operate uh, at the telescope as a little bit of a misnomer because I'm actually 200 feet away from the telescope out that window over there. It's in the observatory. And uh, I'll just show you a quick picture. Uh, that's where the telescope is, out in that roll-off roof, uh, PureTech uh, Telestation 2 Observatory. It's a Ross 11 telescope, but it is hooked up to this screen now. And you're looking now at a, at a live view of Stellarium. And then this is a live view of our telescope. We're looking up at the North Star. So here, when we look at this screen, we're seeing our field of view, roughly, of that RASA 11, Rho Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph 11 telescope. This red rectangle is our field of view. And uh, that field of view can predict roughly what, what we see in Stellarium. It's a great asset for planning your night uh, ex exploration. So what I'm going to do is just run through some of the things I'm learning. And actually, I'll still be learning things as we go. And uh, I wish, I hope, and I'd like to invite you to walk along with me in this and see if you can uh, kind of, you know, learn along with me. I'm going to just uh, open up here and make sure that the audio is coming through okay. Yeah, okay. And uh, welcome to Mike. I see, uh, I see you're on your mic. This is an impromptu kind of a review. It's not really meant to be an interactive uh, uh, live stream like we normally do at Emerald Hill Skies. Normally we're doing observing and people are interacting and it's a community. This is really more about the craft. It's a Emerald Hill Skies Skylet not really one of our typical live streams. So let's suppose that you've opened up Stellarium for the first time. I'm just going to hit some of the high points of what you might want to do. Over here on the left, there is a pop-out screen that you can actually click this little tiny little, um, what would that be called? Like a little arrow down in the lower left. And that little arrow fixes that uh, horizontal menu and the same thing here on this vertical menu. You can kind of fix that so those menus can stay there. I don't really like for them to be there all the time, but at least that gives you an idea. Uh, the first thing that you'll probably want to do is figure out where you are. And uh, I just created a, a, a place uh, 
that represents where the observatory is, complete with the exact latitude and longitude. And you know how you can look that up on an iPhone. It's beyond the scope of this video to, to uh, go that deep into helping you. But look up the latitude and longitude and put that in these latitude and longitude blanks. It'll tell you the altitude, or you can look that up in uh, using uh, Google you know, for your location, put it there in meters, and then you just say add to the list, and then you check uh, the little uh, checkbox that says use the current location as the default. And once you do that, then you won't have to worry about the location anymore until you change locations, I guess. The second thing that you'll want to do is get used to the date and the time window. And you just enter that here. Uh, you can also go down here and click uh, uh, down here at the bottom and click this little, uh, I guess what this is, is like a, a triangle that points down towards your feet. And you can just click that and it'll say now. And that, that sort of synchronizes. And so right now I'm October 20th and this is the actual time that I'm making this video. And so Stellarium is synchronized with the night sky. And as the, as the sky turns, it sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? As the sky turns, as it rotates, actually it's the earth that's rotating past the sky, but it looks like the stars are rotating across the sky. Then Stellarium is going to rotate with them and keep you in sync with the sky if you do that. Then there's a, a viewing options window in which you can set uh, what do you want the night sky to look like. And this is the big picture um, review. So I'm not going to go through each set at a, at a time. I'll just say that you can tune how much of the Milky Way you want to see, uh, how much of the planets and the stars you want to see. You can actually add additional uh, labels so that the sky becomes busier and busier. You can set the magnitude. You can choose which catalogs of deep space objects that you'd like to view, including catalogs that are well known like the Messier list and the Caldwell list and the IC catalog, the NGC catalog, maybe SH2, the dark nebulas and the Malat and the colander lists and all those things you want to see. You can tune and then you can choose how many labels you want to see at what level of zooming in and out and, and how many words you want to see to describe those labels and whether or not you want to see, for example, outlines for the, the nebulae that are up there. Uh, all of these things are up to your personal taste. And uh, you can do the same with which markings you want to see. Now, I have in my screen the meridian marked, and that lets me see when I'm about to cross from what you might say is uh, the eastern half of the sky when it starts to cross over to the west. And I have these cardinal points turned on. I have the compass degrees turned on, so I get a clear picture of of the, what is the zero mark of the horizon. All those things can be tuned and then you can prepare a custom landscape. And I've gone ahead and shot a photographic landscape of where the observatory is located. In fact, you're seeing a rough approximation of the observatory there in, in the bottom of your screen. And uh, that's my truck parked there. And that's normally where my truck is parked. This is the building that I'm in here at Emerald Hills. And I'm in that window right about there. That's my office, you know. So it shows you exactly where I am and it makes it feel like home. Now, it's not as exact as uh, it could be because, you know, shooting around the trees and then thinning those sky uh, out, you know, it, it, it becomes a little more of an approximation, but it makes it feel like home to you. And sure enough, the trees do kind of set the tone for you to see what your horizon looks like. For a more precise horizon, I've also prepared what might be just called a, a polygonal line, just a line that traces the reality of my horizon around the treetops. And I've got mine set so the trees are slightly below that line, and that way I can see things that are about to rise. You know, here's the Dark Horse Nebula. It's just below that true horizon, and that lets me see what's coming up in the next you know, hour or what just sat, I guess you could say. Uh, so if you want to learn how to make those things, again, that's beyond the scope of, of this, um, this overall big picture. But I will point you to this web page. Sorry if that's kind of blinding for you. But it's this link, and I'll put this link in the uh, description. 
it's basically stellarium.sourceforge.net slash wiki slash index.php slash customizing landscapes. You can probably just search Stellarium customizing landscapes and it'll be one of the top few hits. This is the uh, developer provided version of how to do these custom landscapes. And the first one you see is the polygon align method. And then uh, this uh, third uh, method down is the single panorama method. And I was able to follow their directions and and uh, it, it worked for me. Uh, you could try following these directions and if you need additional help, Google around YouTube and you find a lot of people that have already done a deep dive and if it becomes helpful later, I can show you what we went through. But it's basically uh, preparing, for example, to do this, uh, this uh, picture landscape. It's using your smartphone to take what your smartphone now calls a panorama and uh, weaving that together you can also just take uh, one picture at a time and go to a, into a, a program like Photoshop, whatever you have access to. And Photoshop and other programs will stitch these together and will automatically try to match the pictures uh, as long as you overlap enough for each picture. And uh, smartphones are able to take care of a lot of that for you. Once you prepare that picture, then you can use these instructions to put it in the right place on your uh, laptop and then it'll pull this landscape into your view and then you can use this first method to prepare this line like I'm talking about and it's really helpful when I when you're shooting that line to use something like Craig Hunter's the Autolite um, app and that's available for several different platforms here you see it's the Autolite for the iPhone or iPad and uh, this will enable you to um, get a more accurate shot of your particular horizon. If something like the Autolite's available for your particular smartphone, it'll, it'll really help. Notice how I'm clicking on this menu and then I'm, when I click off of it, then uh, that menu sort of grays out. These menus are, um, what do you call this? Uh, Non-modal, I think it's called. You can move them around the screen and get them out of your way and still let them hover. So it's really a pretty cool interface. So I spent a little more time on the landscape because honestly, this is very helpful. And it lets you plan out uh, what you're gonna see. And then other programs, I happen to use Deep Sky Planner for observing lists and observing notes. Uh, you can then use this custom uh, line again, so to speak, in something like Deep Sky Planner, same concept. And again, you can say, uh, uh, show me the things that are available by the local horizon model, if it's available. And that will thin out your list of objects based on the horizon that you've shot. So it is really helpful to plan out your observing, as well as if you're just live. It'll let you see, oh, you know, the Flaming Star Nebula is coming up right now. I can see it coming up in the Northeast. So it's very helpful and I've spent a little more time on there. Uh, there's one of the, one of the programmers, one of the key programmers, in fact, one of the top two programmers for Stellarium is very much into the history of uh, astronomy and the cultural impact of astronomy. So as you can imagine, Stellarium has probably, I think, the most, the, the richest availability of uh, constellation art and lore about that art. And I, for my part, I keep it set on Western because I happen to live in the West, but no matter where you are in the world, you can find interesting lore from your heritage here, I bet. And then there are extra surveys that you can use if you're more into the scientific uh, part of astronomy. I had first thought a long time ago that Starry Night Pro Plus was probably the most powerful, the, the real powerhouse software for amateur astronomers to use. And I apologize to you if I ever tried to talk you into using Starry Night Pro uh, Plus. It had five different alternative surveys that you could bring up in Starry Night Pro. I was amazed when I got into Stellarium and saw all these different surveys that are here, all the ones that Starry Night Pro Plus had and about 15 million thousand percent additional. 
It is so rich, and that's because another one of the programmers is very much into the science part of astronomy, and this comes through. And you'll love it when a programmer does that. So those are all the things you can do in Stellarium to make the night sky uh, match for you. And then there's a find box or a search window, and you can get to that quickly by using Control F, it's the one I use, or F3, and it basically lets you search for things. Last night I happened to be observing the Sol Nebula, and I, I got to it right here in Stellarium. But you might want to use, for instance, the Heart Nebula. So once I search for Heart Nebula, it, it basically cues it up for you. And I think if you hit uh, the space bar, oftentimes it'll make it sort of like centered for you. And then if you hit the uh, forward slash, that's the slash key that, at least on the Windows computer, is over there by the shift key. Uh, to the right, it's right above the control key probably on your keyboard. It's in that first row over to the right. If you hit the forward slash, the zoom is just immediate. And I love that. I don't have to use my wheel a zillion times to zoom in on something. I can just zoom in immediately. And then the backward slash, which is the one that's above the inner key, I bet, on your computer, it's the one where the, the top is tilting backward instead of forward. That's where the slash gets its name. When you hit the backward slash, it takes you back out to the field of view that you had before you zoomed in. And those are two really handy keystrokes. You can zoom in and out really quickly. So now we're looking at the Heart Nebula. And if I hit on my computer, I don't remember if this was a, a default keystroke that was already programmed in, or perhaps I programmed this keystroke in. I can hit F key, and it gets rid of that field of view uh, red hint box that tries to predict what my Rasa telescope is going to see. And if I put, if I hit F again, it puts the telescope back. Now, if I don't like the centering on this, you notice when we went to the Heart Nebula, it centered this cluster that's probably lighting up all this hydrogen alpha gas. But you see up here toward the top, there's kind of a, there's sort of like a, a what would that be called? Like a, an upper part of the Heart Nebula. I can just grab hold of the sky with my left mouse button and just click it and drag it a little bit. Maybe I want to get a little more of that. So what I like about Stellarium is it lets me center the telescope on the field of view that I'm looking at in Stellarium, which is a pretty cool deal. If I want to go to this uh, default cluster, I just hit Control-1, and the telescope slews over there. So let's just try that real quick. Notice I'm here on the Heart Nebula. My telescope is over here where it says Rasa 11. You can see the crosshairs there. It's pointing at the North Star. But if I now hit Control 1, then the Rasa is going to move across the sky. And you can see it move across on Solarium, and then you can also see it moving in real time out there at the observatory. So now the Rasa has tuned itself to the exact place. And what the Ross is going to do, if I uh, come over to the live view of the camera, now this is uh, what the telescope is seeing. I'm going to do a, a plate solve real quick. And what that does, uh, by the way, is it just synchronizes the exact uh, thing that the mount is looking at with what you really wanted the mount to look at. And all this operates through the uh, magic of a background infrastructure called ASCOM, Stellarium plays well with ASCOM. It's, it's developed with ASCOM in mind. Well, my telescope, this is the first object that I've slewed to. My telescope was 1.21 degrees off. So what SharpCap, which is the imaging program that we're using here now to look through our telescope, what SharpCap is doing is, is actually now synchronizing the real view through the telescope with the alleged desired view that we were trying to see when we told uh, the telescope where to go. So that cluster you see in the middle, uh, if we kind of zoom in on it, that cluster is the cluster that's in the middle of Stellarium right here. Now we're not seeing the nebulosity yet because I've got a fairly short exposure going. Let's uh, lengthen our exposure to 20 seconds. And why don't we drop this, um, I don't know, this ISO down to 200 maybe. And um, and then we'll start live stacking, and it's kind of an off-subject thing, but live stacking is, um, is a, a way to 
combine images together, even though you're doing observing live. And you don't have to go back in the observatory. You don't have to go back in the uh, dark room. You don't have to go back in the, in the workroom where you're going to start stacking things on your computer memory because instead the, the SharpCap software is doing that for you in the RAM. And we have a moonless night tonight, so it's a good night to look at the Heart Nebula. What I'm going to do is move the, uh, I'm going to define the darks here to about right there. I'm going to go a little bit farther to the left than I normally would because the Heart Nebula is very faint. And it's also hydrogen alpha, so I'm going to try to pick up some of those reds. And you know, we're only viewing now for 60 seconds. We, we have a combined integration of 60 seconds, but look, you can already see the middle of that heart nebula, and look what we pulled in up here in the upper left. We've pulled in that uh, top of the nebula a little bit. We, we've pulled it in up here. But look, we're losing a little bit of this top. And uh, suppose that I wanted to get all of that top. Okay, so let's stop live stacking. Let's go back to Stellarium and say, boy, I really wanted to get more of that. Now, I'm not lined up with where Stellarium thinks that the Heart Nebula is because Stellarium queued up the Heart Nebula to be centered on this cluster. But now I can use Alt-1 and the telescope will adjust slightly. Look how that little crosshair is moving. And the crosshair moved to the center of where we had the Rasa 11 field of view. So Stellarium is really easy to work with live at the scope. Now we can go back to the real view, and with us being this close, um, we don't have to live stack again. We don't, we don't have to plate solve again. But uh, because we're using 20 second observation, 20 second exposures, uh, there was some movement in the scope. Well, now we've got a new exposure going, so now we've got new stars, and I can start the live stack in this uh, settled, we might call it, this settled picture. I'm going to clear the memory of SharpCap, and we're going to let that start live stacking, and we'll come back to it in a minute after it's live stacked, and probably for a, a well, look, we've got that beautiful now, that upper part, it's already showing up after just 20 seconds, and that's in a very, what we call a, a fast scope. This is like, what, f2.2 or something. It's, I forget. Is it, see, it's, is it 600, um, 600, where do I have that written down? Um, over here, um, in this scope, it's, uh, it's 620 focal length. So it's a 620 millimeter focal length. So it's very wide field. The field of view is, uh, we'll be able to see over here in Stellarium because when we hit F1, it tells us the field of view. It's two degrees, 10 arc minutes by one degree, 27 arc minutes. This is two by one and a half degree field of view. It's very large. And uh, that's what you want for a, a, nebula like, a nebula like this that's pretty large. You actually want something like that. But I guess, you know, in, in SharpCap, this, this has given us this beautiful now upper edge of the Heart Nebula. And because it's got that 620 millimeter field of view, a byproduct of that is it has a very, uh, a very low number of focal length, focal ra sorry, focal ratio, uh, something like f2.2. And you know how that works. The lower the number of the focal ratio, the more the aperture is open on the on the SLR camera if you're from a photography world. Likewise, the more the aperture is open on the telescope and it can drink light in faster. So that's why we were already seeing a lot of this nebula after just uh, 20 seconds. And we'll see even more as it continues to unfold. So you can see here's a brighter part of the red that's already starting to uh, be visible here. We'll let that, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, like let it cook. And we'll come back to it in a minute. Now, we don't want to change the Rasa, but the great part about Stellarium is we can move now Stellarium around and look at other parts of the sky, and it won't change what the Rasa is doing. Look how my field of view predictor is here, but the Rasa is still imaging the Heart Nebula there. So I can go around and look at other things now. 
Now, I probably shouldn't, uh, you know, move the telescope to them, but for instance, if I want to see, you know, the Andromeda galaxy, it's pretty high tonight, isn't it? We see here in Solarium, if we look up here in the upper left uh, corner, it tells us a lot of information, and we can see the altitude is 60 degrees. So that's a great time to be able to image the Andromeda galaxy, and if I want to center that in my field of view, I just hit the space bar. And then I can hit this forward slash, and it zooms in on the Andromeda galaxy. I can zoom in even closer by using the wheel on my mouse and fill the whole screen with this uh, beautiful uh, Andromeda galaxy. That's, uh, what, M31? And then here's a satellite uh, galaxy of Andromeda called M32. And then here's another satellite, M110. And you can see that in our RASA, uh, I'm already planning my next observation, you might say. I'll be able to get all of this, the whole thing, the, the entire Andromeda galaxy and M32 and M110 all in one perfect frame. And it happens that the way I have my camera spun on the RASA, uh, which is permanently the way I leave it, it's perfect to get a nice diagonal of the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, this is going to work out great. So you see how Stellarium is helping me plan. And that's how this uh, Finder screen works. Control F or F3 lets you look for things. Uh, now further down the left-hand side, there is a, a wrench here that lets you configure things. And whatever settings that you've changed, you can always use Save Settings, and that will let you remember them for the next uh, observation session. And that's kind of a bit of a catch in Stellarium. Unless you click Save Settings, everything you change will be forgotten, and the next time you open Stellarium, it will default to the uh, settings that were there when you opened it first time. So you got to remember to click that Save Setting. And if you'd like a certain view, I have my version of Stellarium set up so that when it opens, it's always aimed toward the North Star, uh, the North Celestial Pole, I should say. And that's because the telescope starts aimed at the North Celestial Pole. So they're nice and in sync from the very beginning, but you can save whatever view you want here. And this is where you pick what's going to be up here in the upper left. You can choose uh, one little dot at a time what you're going to have up there, or choose from one of the default information levels they have. There are lots of extra buttons that you can show down in these lower menus down here to the left, and I don't have very many. I just have this one called Flip, and that lets me sometimes be able to flip the screen uh, of Stellarium both vertically and horizontally, which is kind of a handy thing to do depending on um, the type of telescope you have and what maybe accessory you're using, and when you're getting used to the scope. Uh, so all those uh, information buttons are there for the menus. And here's where you can make some uh, broad uh, default decisions about time and date. And here are some tools you can use that give you options that let you decide things like, do you want to use keyboard navigation or do you just want to uncheck that and not use it? Uh, where are the screenshots going to go? When you uh, automatically save the view of the screen of your planetarium software, where is it going to go? And that, that's down here is where you decide where that can happen. Stellarium comes with an entire library of scripts that people have written to be able to do things with the program that the program didn't necessarily come with by default or that the developers chose really not to build into the core code yet. Now maybe in a future iteration that stuff will be in the core code. One of the ones that I use here is the one that gives you control of your telescope. And uh, that that's, uh, oh I'm sorry, that, that's a plugin rather. Uh, that would be a plugin here. It's kind of like a script, but it's kind of like an add-on. And that's telescope control. You check load it at startup and then you can configure it here, choose your scope and everything. There is an oculars uh, plug-in that lets you choose what telescopes you're going to be able to have access to. I only own one telescope, so I just have it set to be default to that one scope. But you might have several, and you can do that in Stellarium. But back on these scripts, it's kind of like uh, automated tours through the night sky. And you might, you might uh, do, for instance, the Messier tour, and it's just going to take you one at a time through all the 110 objects in the Messier catalog. And, and when it's done, it'll 
it'll it'll try to go back and reset the screen like you had it before. If you interrupt in the middle, that's bad because it'll it'll default to those settings that were in the library of that script. So you kind of have to be careful not to interrupt it in the middle of its thing. Uh, those scripts are more kind of like a planetarium tour, but they would be handy if that's what you're using the program to do. Uh, these plugins, you know, it means that Stellarium is open to the future. Different people can write other plugins, and uh, we'll be able to install those and uh, make Stellarium do things that didn't come with the program by default. So that's all in the configuration window. And then there's also a really scientific area here uh, that lets you deal with uh, the deep science of observing. And uh, these things have to do with, for example, uh, eclipses and ephemeris. Uh, um, let me just uh, do a quick note here. Um, um, you'll be able to do deep science in Stellarium. And like I said before, um, uh, I used to think that Starry Night Pro was like the, the absolute powerhouse for doing science. And that's before I got to all these things. You can focus on positions of stuff, and you can focus on uh, computing the ephemeris of where a planet is going to be, and uh, different phenomena, and graph things, where, where something's going to be in the night sky at a certain time and on a certain date. Uh, figure out what, when an eclipse is going to happen, and, and uh, do all of this for whatever time you want in the future. So it's very powerful for doing science and is used in a lot of papers. And then this is the help screen, and what I love about this especially is you can edit these keyboard shortcuts uh, depending on what, uh, what you want Stellarium to do, you can, you can actually uh, customize the keyboard shortcuts. That's why a while ago I said, now when I did the field of view and I made it F, was that something that I did or did it come uh, by default like that? And I think, you know, that's the way you can make uh, Stellarium function for you. You can actually uh, decide uh, how you want it to, to function and what command you want to give it, and then you can save those commands as your, as your default, or you can go back and restore the default. And you can search for different uh, uh, commands. If I, if I can't remember what is the field of view, uh, command, you can search for field view and see what the the, the uh, defaults are. And all of that is built in for you here in this uh, help screen. And then uh, there's an about screen that lets you check for updates. And you can see this is Stellarium 1.0. By the way, they went on and called it version 1.22.3. It's kind of confusing in a way because the program was up to 22 iterations in the sub-1 version, they were calling it 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 down through the years. And the most recent update, which was less than the increment of version 1.0, was 0 0.22. So they kept the numbering of 1.22. And one of the reasons they did that is they're going to continue, the programmers are going to continue to retain the accessibility of the 0 0.2 versions. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, look at how this is uh, based on a kind of an infrastructure that is built around a version of this infrastructure called 6. And uh, some computers are not compatible, I understand, with this 6. It happens that mine is, so I can use this 1.22 version. But this is how much the developers love everybody. If your computer can't run that 6 level iteration of this infrastructure, you can keep using the 0 0.22 and they don't mind and they're going to retain it and they're going to keep it up, which I think is really a nice gesture. There is a, a logging function here that's kind of to be able to find uh, errors that, that basically the developers can use. And then there's a config screen here that lets you look at the config.ini. Again, it's for developers, but I think it's nice that they have this stuff built in so that uh, uh, the program can keep developing, and that's why it's got such a long life, uh, two decades. Uh, down here in the bottom uh, screen, you can add constellation lines uh, so that uh, 
you know, you can see the, the night sky and it's in the form of constellations. You can label those. So you can memorize those, however many they are. I forget, is it 88? I forget the, num the number of constellations. You can also put the artwork there if you're into that sort of thing. And some people think this helps them learn the night sky and all those stories, you know. You can use uh, the equatorial grid system, which centers around the North Celestial Pole, or you can use the Alt Azimuth grid system, which uh, more is in tune with how you'd think of a traditional compass and traditional degrees up and down the sky. It's the, this is the grid you would want to use if you have the fork-mounted Alt Azimuth telescope, but they've given you both abilities. This is what you'd use if you have an equatorial scope like we do. The, uh, the telescope spins with the night sky, and so we would use this equatorial grid if we wanted to see a grid. This lets you uh, get rid of your horizon. If you want to get rid of it temporarily for some reason, you can kind of make it go away, and that lets you see what's beneath the horizon, and then you can put it back again. Uh, this uh, gets rid of the atmosphere, and I have the atmosphere gone, but you can put the atmosphere back, and, and then uh, if you put the atmosphere back, you're going to see a lot less of these beautiful objects because the atmosphere is going to clog up, uh, you know, with close to the horizon or whatever. This uh, icon here lets you see deep sky objects or gets rid of them. And uh, this uh, uh, does the same with planets, gets rid of planets. You can switch between an equatorial mount and an altazimuth mount, and uh, Stellarium will work with either one. It's a switch hitter like that, which is really nice. These are those flip the scene buttons I told you about. And you can even now look at exoplanets that are uh, being surveyed very powerful. And you know there are thousands of these being discovered through spectroscopy using things like the James Webb Space Telescope and uh, have been studying through the Hubble Space Telescope and others. And these exoplanets are places someday that we might be able to see with uh, telescopes. But right now we can see the evidence of them being there through spectroscopy. And you can see what are the stars that have those candidates. And then here you can toggle meteor shower source points on and off. And uh, you can show meteor showers in a search dialog and figure out where they're originating in case you're interested in observing those. Uh, you can use remote control with Stellarium. You can use it wirelessly if your mount functions with that. Uh, it also lets you see satellites, and every once in a while you'll see one float by, and when you click on it, it tells you what satellite it is, which is fascinating. Uh, this is the menu that lets you choose uh, what your location is, and then these little BCR-type playback uh, buttons let you choose whether to go backward in time or forward in time, and uh, you can go back to when you were born and see you know, what the sky looked like at the very moment you were born, or go forward and see what it's going to look like, you know, four years from now on the night that you're going to get married and plan, you know, what constellation you're going to write a song about for your spouse or whatever you want to do. I mean, this thing is going to take care of you no matter what your need is. So uh, up here in the upper right, there's this uh, ocular uh, menu that lets you uh, put which eyepieces you have. Now, we happen at Emerald Hill Skies, we use uh, electronically assisted astronomy, which means we're viewing the night sky through a camera. And that lets us live stream the night sky to you in the live streams that we do. Uh, but a lot of people still use uh, traditional eyepieces. I mean, the majority of amateur astronomers do. So this lets you put in your eyepiece, lets you put in what kind of telescope you have, and uh, then you can choose what kinds of... Uh, finders that you have, and, uh, and then this lets you add and delete those so that you can basically put your entire library of equipment there, binoculars or whatever you have, and it'll predict what the field of view looks like as accurately as possible. You can see Jupiter is here, and uh, if we just center on Jupiter for a minute and zoom in on it, you can see that it shows us the moons of Jupiter, and these are real time, the moons that are there. So we can see Europa, and if we zoom in a little bit closer, that's Io. And then uh, Ganymede is here, and Callisto is here. So when we go look at Jupiter, we'll see exactly this view in the telescope field of view. And 
this is real time. And not only that, but smaller moons are going to be there, and it lets you identify them as well. That happens to be a star. But here is, for instance, the moon Phoebe of Jupiter. And you can do all kinds of things with these moons. You can show their, uh, their orbits around the planet. And if one of them is going to cross in front of the planet, uh, then you can predict when it's going to start crossing. So if your telescope has a long focal length, mine doesn't, but, but you can actually watch that shadow crossing Jupiter. And you can practice that in Stellarium in advance with uh, real time and predict exactly when you should have your telescope set up. This lets you predict, is this a star or is it another moon? You know, you can, you can tell the difference with Stellarium and uh, see each of these. Um, I just saw a moon well down below here. And, you know, not all of the, what, how many moons are there discovered now in Jupiter? I mean, something like, uh, uh, is it uh, 80 or something? There are so many, and they're all charted here. You can look for comets that are already in the database, but if you discover a comet someday, you can add it manually to um, Stellarium. And what I love about it is you can use online databases and import the comet's uh, orbital elements so that you can now track the comet uh, real time in Stellarium, even though it was just discovered. And those orbital elements, the moment that they're made public, you'll be able to put them in. Now in Starry Night Sky, and Starry Night Pro Plus, I went through the trouble for my part and I figured out how to put those elements in so I could track things like asteroids and comets, but boy, it was painstaking. I had to manually put them in. Here with Stellarium, they've developed the infrastructure so you can actually import those over the web and it's just so easy. Um, I am learning so far all of this stuff, but I feel like I'm just getting started. Now, if we go back over here to the night sky, you can see that we're, we're seeing now a little bit more of the Hart Nebula and we can dial up our mids so we can see even a little bit more of it. Take a look at those hydrogen alpha clouds. And what we might do now, it's been uh, uh, stacking frames this whole time. And we have uh, 19 minutes of exposure. Of course, in real astrophotography, you might do six hours of uh, exposures. And maybe each exposure is gonna be five minutes. The way we do electronically assisted astronomy, we might use an exposure of uh, I'm using 20 seconds at a gain of 200. And then by stacking those, we can start seeing uh, quite a bit of detail because what we're doing in electronically assisted astronomy is observing real time. Well, Stellarium lets us plan for how to do that. And no matter what object we want to go look at, it lets us plan for that and execute it really well. So I'll save a picture of this now just as a keepsake. I'm not going to turn it into anything because there are a lot prettier pictures of the Heart Nebula uh, that somebody went and, and took online, you know, that are now online, where they did six hours of integration. And I never do 20 minutes. I mean, the longest we look at any object in EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy, at least for us here at Emerald Hill Skies, is usually around uh, maybe seven minutes. That's about the limit, sometimes eight or nine. If we're really getting into, you know, somebody's, uh, you know, list, like here we're using currently Stephen James O'Meara's book, which he called The Secret Deep. And we use that to plan our observations. And if, if we're really reading about an object like the Heart Nebula, then it might sit there and, and uh, perk, percolate, you know, for eight or nine minutes. But normally it's seven minutes per object, and then we're on to the next thing. Stellarium works great for EAA, but it would also work great for someone who's an astrophotographer to be able to plan the pictures and get the objects centered in your frame to strike. Now there are other uh, software that'll let you do this planning if you're an astrophotographer. You might like Nina, for instance, and other examples. But for a planetarium software, if that's what you're looking for, man, I am now convinced that Stellarium actually beats Starry Night Pro Plus. Maybe Starry Night Pro Plus has a more beautiful image, but look, this is actually pretty good looking. I mean, especially for an open source, look at that Milky Way, and I can, I can dial that up as bright as I want it, by the way. Uh, this is a beautiful night sky, and I think this is really good, and it's an open source program that you can download right now, wherever you are in, 
in the world, just go to Stellarium.org and install it on whatever you're using. And you can even use Stellarium as a web application and not download it and use it uh, real time in your web browser. So um, let's summarize. In my opinion, uh, for the money, Starry Night Pro Plus, I don't remember how much it cost. It was like, is it $150 to just get in the gate? I mean, for the money and also for the science, let alone for the functionality. I mean, let me just be really honest with you. Cutthroat. I'm sorry, Simulation Curriculum, the makers of Starry Night uh, Pro Plus, but I reported these glitches to you and you were doing nothing about them over the course of like a year. And I even got on your website and then on your help forums and I wrote your customer support people month after month after month for these glitches, like glitches in the telescope control, glitches in the observing panel, and a lot of other places, and you just never fixed it. Whereas Stellarium, constantly working on this over the last 20 years, making it into this beautiful software that they now felt like it was good enough to call it one point something. And I think hats off to you guys who did the programming for Stellarium because you were so... Uh, diligent to create this beautiful software for the world to use and now you've set it free for the world well this is uh, a review of Stellarium uh, 1.0 and I hope that you'll enjoy it as much as I am enjoying it and I hope you'll get in there and get to learn it and I'm learning the keystrokes and learning how to hook up as you can see the telescope to it and and uh, making progress on all this I encourage you to do the same thing Hunt for constellations, use it with binoculars, use it with your school class, buy a inflatable balloon or something and project on the inside of the balloon. I mean, you, the sky is the limit for what you can, in fact, the sky is no longer the limit because this shows you what's beyond the sky <laughs> that you can't even see. If you hear something that the James Webb Space Telescope, the JWST, is observing, uh, Look it up and see if it's in Stellarium and see if you can zoom in on it. And if it's not, you'll probably be able to create it and plot it there. So the sky is no longer the limit. I encourage you to check it out. If you like content like that, whether it's live streams of observing lists, like uh, books like this, the, we're, we're currently working our way through the Caldwell list and also the Herschel 400, also the the hidden treasure list, and now the secret deep list. We're working our way through those as the year goes by. If you like content like this, we'd encourage you to subscribe. Uh, if you like this, click thumbs up. If you don't like it, by, by all means, feel free to skip it. Um, if you would like to learn more about what we do at Emerald Hill Skies, by all means, subscribe to the YouTube channel. But also, you can go to emeraldhillskies.com, and you'll see there our website, and all these videos are archived there. You can subscribe to an email list that lets you get notified when we're doing regular live streams. Live streams. Ah! Live streams. Uh, but like this Skylet, we, we don't, didn't notify people on this. But normally you can be notified and it creates a community. We've got a great community now in our live streams and we encourage you to join those. Uh, you can see our lists and where we're working through and what we've observed and what we still have to observe. Uh, there is also a lot about our equipment there. And there's a resource for those who want to learn electronically assisted astronomy under the resources tab. And you can get to that also by going directly to eaa101.com. And it takes you right to that page, eaa101.com. There's also brand new because some people were asking for Emerald Hill Skies merchandise. And we didn't want to do this, but people were asking for it, so we finally did. If there's, and if there's money that comes in for it, then we're going to use all that money and donate it to a charity. So I'm not taking the money for myself. Uh, or for the observatory. Uh, for instance, right now we're using the money to help Ukrainian families that are trying to make it through the winter in the middle of this conflict over there in that war. So uh, any money that you donate through that uh, site, and that site, it has a unique name. Let me see if I can uh, show it to you real quick. It's, uh, oh, I don't have it up here. What is it uh, called? Uh, Pre, uh, Patreon, that's what it is. Patreon.com slash Emerald Hill Skies. Patreon.com Emerald Hill Skies. And literally, we just launched it yesterday, so it's still pretty new to me. 
but it'll let you uh, join at different levels and uh, at that level you can then uh, pick up merchandise like an Emerald Hill Skies mug or sticker or t-shirt or poster or organic tote or long sleeve shirt or hoodie or you can just look at it that you're going to get digital downloads from Emerald Hill Skies but more than anything else you're just helping this work and encouraging it by by going forward so if you like stuff like this I hope uh, I hope you'll take part in it I'll show you that uh, I realize I wasn't showing you the screen but you can you can uh, take part in any of this uh, patreon site that you want p a t r e o n patreon.com slash emerald hill skies I'll put the link for that in the description down below this video well that's all she wrote that's all we're gonna do for this kind of rather deeper dive into the big picture of Stellarium uh, if the situation warrants we can zoom in on some of these individual questions but I think you get the big picture and it's very intuitive to jump in on and there are lots of videos already available on YouTube as well but we're learning this and we love it and we encourage you to try to thanks for taking part in this uh, Emerald Hill Skies Skylet tonight and we hope you'll stop back and see some of the live streams again God bless have a great day talk to you later good night from Emerald Hill